I'm pleased to introduce our keynote speakers, Lieutenant General Benny Gantz and Lieutenant General David Friedrich. <laughs> General Benny Gantz was Chief of Staff of the Israeli Defense Forces from 2011 to 2015. He was the IDF most senior officers during the Operation Pillar of Defense in November 2012, Operation Protective Edge in summer 2014, and the release of IDF soldiers Gilad Shalit in October 2011. In an IDF career spanning over then more than 35 years, General Gantz also served as Deputy Chief of Staff IDF Defensive Attaché in Washington, and Chief of Ground Forces Command. He holds master's degree in political science for the University of Haifa, and in national resource management from the Industrial College of the Armed Forces, National Defense University in Washington. Please welcome Lieutenant General Benny Gantz. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nitsana. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's an honor to speak uh, in front of you. And knowing that I'm the warm-up of General Fridovich, then I'm, first of all, I'm beginning right. Let me start with the good news and the bad news. And with your permission, I will start with the good news. Uh, we started early, so it will finish early. Uh, it's in Jerusalem. And uh, the bad news is that now you're going to hear the worst English throughout those two days. <laughs> the good news, however, is that that's it. I mean, the first one and the last one in terms of bad English, because I know who's the, who are the guys who speaks after me. Uh, but nevertheless, and now seriously, I'm very pleased to be here this morning. Uh, and uh, be here in Jerusalem, uh, it is very important for me. Uh, I try uh, in the last, uh, during the last two months of my liberation, I would say, um, not to speak in front of wide audience. Uh, I didn't expect it to be that wide. However, I thought it's very important that I will come here and tell you and expose you with my perspective about a very important issue that is being promoted here uh, for the benefit of all human rights, humankind, democratic countries and societies. Um, obviously, my perspective is not necessarily a legal one. I'm an IDF commander. That's what I've done for the last almost 38 years. Uh, that's my proficiency, not the legal aspects of it. I am exposed, obviously, to legal aspects. And I've been, obviously, advised, consulted with legal advisor on all different echelons. But my perspective that I would like to share with you is a combination of, I would say, uh, both strategic and moral perspective with a flame of practical aspects of it as much as I can uh, in the limits of time and the situation here. Let me say a few words as a background assumption, I would say. We must understand that the nature of war didn't change, but its characteristics has changed a lot. And the combination of those two aspects of the relevancy of the nature of war 
with everything that has to do with it, unpredictable, fear, mess, conflicting, is there as it was thousand years back. But what happened to the battlefield? It disappeared. No longer, you, or you hardly can find, maybe you still can, but you can hardly find battlefield as we used to portray it before, where military forces went to meet each other when it started just two knights fighting each other instead of wasting the whole battalion, then they would send phalanx and fight each other in, in, in remote places, but the society was not the target there during the war. But now it all changed. Because we see uh, new characteristics of it. Then we see the new dimensions. Uh, it can be uh, uh, space, which is not in the hands of terrorists yet, but uh, cyber, undersurface, and all those elements uh, that they can already use, uh, and they have the means to do it, uh, etc. Obviously, we must say something about the civilian population. It became both the target of the operation by the terrorists and the non-state actors, and the human shield at the same time. And times before, obviously, uh, they were not part of uh, they were not part of the of the campaign itself. They may have been used after the campaign. You, know, you take prisoners, you take everything that you, you militaries or countries used to join, the, the whatever they have gained from the war itself. But um, currently, it's a whole different story, and we must bear this in our mind because eventually. And we keep saying it all the time, that after all, the soldier at the very end is exposed to the nature of war as well. And the uncertainties and the fear and all the, the challenges that war brings to the soldier at the end, whatever the end is, is very, very demanding and very, very challenging. A few more important points before going into practices. I would say that we must understand that it's a huge strategic operational challenge to cope with. Since we don't have those tough but simple wars, and I'm very glad we don't. Uh, it becomes very, very complicated. Nitsana have portrayed so brightly and what it means for a democratic country to go to a war, what it what bans into itself. Uh, so before you even started as a country to protect yourself, Israel went in my like in, in my tenure as the chief of staff, we were, we were involved, let's say, in three major campaigns. Uh, pillar of defense, uh, we had to seek for those three kids in, the, in Samaria and fight Hamas at the same time, and obviously protective edge. In each and every campaign, we lost before we started as far as the international community, before we even start anything. And on the operational level, let's say that I would sit and see how do you use your aerial force? Uh, how do you differ between civilians and non-civilians? You sit in a cockpit of, op of UAVs, of unmanned vehicles uh, operators, and they look at images, and I sit with them, and I see the discussion in the cell itself. This guy, it looks too low, maybe it's a kid. It's too short, maybe it's a kid. And all those, and it's those guys are living this operational dilemma every second of their operation, and they have a mission to fulfill, obviously. Secondly, obviously, you have a dual dilemma. Both of it is, has to do with, I would say, dual moral dilemma. 
Because on one hand, you want to, to avoid hurting the wrong people on the other side. But at the same time, you need to protect your own country and to a degree, your soldier into a reasonable level, even though they do take risks on themselves. So it's a major dilemma that you must uh, be aware of. And obviously, uh, we chose uh, to protect our people, even though we did not neglect not hurting the one we don't want to hurt as much as we can. And obviously, I will bring up a few examples later. Whose responsible is it during the campaign itself? It's the commanders. Before and after, it's a dual, I would say, responsibility of both commanders, strategic level, statehood level, and professional legal level to try and really, as you are doing, to try to rephrase, adjust uh, the laws that will be more relevant uh, to current challenges. But during the war itself, uh, even though we have a very high level of involvement by uh, attorneys and lawyers and advisors, after all, it is our responsibility to fulfill our mission with all the limits that comes with it in defending ourselves and offensive the other side as well. Um, and the fourth, and, 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 and seriously, it's important, I think, really to, to, to try and go back to times where the laws of war meant to limit the bad guys. That was the case when they started to come up with, with the laws of war. The assumption was that people would behave according to the ethics, to the right laws. And you had to have laws to limit those who don't obey them. But currently, those who don't obey them, guess what? They don't care. So the only one who deals with it, rightly so, it's those who care, which we will continue to deal with it because it's important for us as well, or for us before others. So uh, the last point on this aspect, I would say that we cannot, in, uh, we cannot risk uh, having uh, legal naivety, I would say, and not to update the laws and the regulations uh, to current realities, but nor should we ignore statehood responsibilities because all those organizations are operating not from nowhere, they are operating in a well in most cases, I would say, they are operating from well-controlled and managed areas. That's the case in Lebanon. That's even the case of Hamas in Gaza. They're not operating from the nowhere. They are responsible for the area. They claim for sovereignty. They negotiate as far as sovereignty. They are practicing sovereignty. They have their security force, military, uh, policing forces for their interest, etc., etc. We cannot ignore it. Uh, nor should we uh, ignore it in the future. Uh, so let me, for example, take the last two campaigns uh, in both Gaza and Lebanon and take them as the case studies briefly. Uh, we saw in Gaza, in all the event, that all the activities really started by the terrorists themselves. Not even one operation started in Gaza. I'm not talking about tactically how you start at the day and at the hour, but if you take the strategic situation. Uh, it was always, in both cases, both in Gaza and in Lebanon, activities initiated by the terrorist organizations and the State of Israel and the IDF had to retaliate and to uh, start its operations after that event started. Uh, Israel is trying uh, to hold its, its force as much as it can until it comes to a point of no choice. We are being criticized of that. 
People tell us, why did you wait with the tunnels? Why did you do this? Why do you do that? Okay, those are fair, this, this is a fair discussion. This is not what this, this conference is all about, but let's say that we need to understand that Israel have zero interest in Gaza, zero interest in Lebanon to exclude security from this area. Uh, and uh, we saw in both cases uh, what happened. We saw in both cases that the enemies have operated from inside civilian society, uh, both in Gaza and unfortunately we see it in Lebanon as well. Um, if we take the example of Lebanon, we are aware of the relations, tight relations, between Hezbollah organization and the government of Lebanon, not just on the political level when they have representative, but also on the operational level and the interlevel between different elements of the Lebanese armed forces and Hezbollah organizations. So that means we cannot let aside the Lebanese statehood responsibility for whatever happens from Lebanon in, future, in previous campaigns, nor in future campaigns as well. Uh, let's see Hezbollah is using the villages of Lebanon as, I would say, a, they turn, practically turn them into an operational villages to enable them to set the launching capabilities, to defend those launching capabilities, to maintain logistic missiles and capabilities in the area, command and control, intergathering, etc., etc., from the same village that you, it looks as a regular village, but I'm telling you it's a missile village. I'm telling you it's a rocket village. And the IDF have exposed a few years back the story of the town of El Khiam. It's a town I've been there so many times in, in my service. It's a small sized town, full with rockets. Dozens of houses. I have a living room in my house. I guess all of you have. I don't have a missile room in my house. I guess you don't either. But I'm telling you that in Lebanon, you have a missile room and a living room in the same house. How do you want me to differ between the missile room and the living room? I'm telling you that if I can, I will do all my effort to differ between the two. But eventually, how precise can you end up being? So we had no, uh, we had no alternative, or we had no alternative before, and we will have no alternative in the future, but taking out all those houses that we are aware of them being used for military use. So actually you take a civilian place and you turn it into a military practical target. So don't tell me it's a kindergarten when I know it's a missile room. If I go to Gaza, don't tell me it's a mosque if I know it's a, it's a, it's a rocket warehouse place. I know it is there. See the explosions. I'm not aware of not one synagogue in Israel or one church in other places that is being used to host terrorist meeting points, uh, rockets, missiles, ammo, whatever. I dream of those days that I will have a swimming pool in my garden. I don't. But what happened in Gaza? Instead of swimming pool in the garden, they have a missile pool. The launcher is there already between the trees, well covered, well digged into the ground. All it takes is a hydraulic system, it brings it up, it shoots out. Should I take it or should I not? Israel knows a lot, it has a great intersystem, but there is a limit to what an intersystem can know at the end of the day, even though we are, we are pretty good. We are pretty good. In both cases, we alert the society, the civilian side on the other side. We tell them, flee the area. That was the case in Lebanon. That was the case in Gaza. It came to this 
amazing tactic of what we all call knock on the roof. Nitzana talked about it. We first allow him to flee yourself, then we destroy the place. I know it sounds ridiculous, but since we understand the dilemma, since we live the dilemma of civilians and terrorists in the same place, so we sometimes go into paradox, but we morally choose to do so. Morally choose to do so. And there are cases which we know that it's, a, it's, it's such a sensitive target, such an important target that we know. And some places we don't do. Uh, I'll bring you the story of two, two, two hospitals in, in Gaza during the last campaign, Shifa and Wafa. Shifa is the main hospital. It was full with refugees during the war itself the campaign itself, so many times this issue came up, uh, should we attack there or not, and I always rejected it, no, even though I knew, I knew that the Hamas leadership and the Jihad Islamic Palestinian group leadership is somewhere there under the ground of certain buildings that I suspected there. And I didn't even try to evacuate the civilians from there. But also let me give you the, the example that I think was brought here of, Betholi, of a hospital Wafa in the town of Sajaia. During the campaign itself, Golani Brigade that we know were underneath this hospital after the story of the anti-tank missile shooting and everything. And they were shot from the hospital. And we pre-alert the hospital, we make sure that no one is there. We did the entire circuit. And then they wanted to, to attack it. And I was there on the ground, and I said, wait. And we took the risk on Golani Brigade, me personally. And once again, we verified there's no one there. Once again, we called the managers. And not before we did this, once again, I approved to attack the place, and indeed no one was hurt during the, the attack itself, no civilians as far as I'm aware were attacked during the, the event itself. But I took risk on Golani Brigade to do it. In other cases, maybe I cannot take this risk. I'm not saying it's not a, 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 a generic formula that you can, you know, A leads to B, etc., etc. There are different calculus in different situations. So we do take risks. In all cases, we continued our effort to maintain humanitarian support to those places. That was the case with Lebanon, where we coordinate ourselves with the uh, international organizations in Lebanon. That was the case in Gaza, both with international organizations uh, but also with medical aids and uh, humanitarian support. And uh, we did that while taking a risk. Uh, I want to take you to a personal story for a second. Uh, unfortunately, uh, both my parents passed away. Uh, however, my mother was, uh, my mother was a Holocaust survivor. Uh, from Bergen-Belsen. Uh, she survived the war, uh, came to Israel. They've built a village uh, where they lived all their life. It's in the southern part of our country. Moshav Kfarachim, for those who are familiar with the map. During castled operation, rockets fell in our backyard. So I told them, Mom, are you going to the shelter? She said, no. I says, why no? Why not? She said, first, I saw more things than that. Secondly, she said, she had a nice sense of humor. She said, if it doesn't hit you, it's not a problem. If it hits you, it's not a problem either. <laughs> not, at least not, in, not anymore. So, so I said, uh, then she said, seriously, Benny, don't stop fighting, but don't stop sending them food." End of quote. It became 
לייק, צבא, a will, yeah, maybe a will, living will, for me to use later. So while this campaign in Gaza lasts for seven weeks, we kept sending food on a daily basis. We built uh, a hospital in the, in the Erez crossing that about 50 Palestinians came to be treated there, but only 50 because Hamas won't allow the rest of them to come there. The only thing that came from Gaza more than missiles to Israel is patients that came to be treated in Israeli hospitals. And let me tell you something. I don't feel wrong with that. I feel very proud with that, even though it doesn't make sense at the beginning, but I do feel proud that I am on the right side morally, not just strategically speaking. And I think we should keep it this way, even though that sometimes it makes our life a bit harder. We don't want to make it simple. We just want to make it reasonable. This is the only issue that we are saying. So unfortunately, Gaza have paid the price of the war. Unfortunately, Lebanon have paid the price of the war. But let me tell you something. It's going to be worse next time. Because the Israel have no alternative but living through this moral and strategic dilemma of defending its people and trying to minimize the collateral damage and the hitting of the wrong people on the other side. But nevertheless, we need to defend our country. Let's for a second imagine that 10 or 12 terrorists would have taken us as a group as a hostage here. Two in each side, three in the middle, the leader sits here, etc., etc. booby trap, name it. Now what? The country come to rescue us. It can give up, should it? I think not. As long as people or countries have operational alternative, they should stick to it. Otherwise, you'll strategically be blackmailed. Of course, that when the counterterrorism unit, whatever, walks in, they'll do all the effort they can to differ between us as hostages and the terrorists. Can they always? Should they when it's enemy? If they cannot do it vis-a-vis -vis their own people. So we don't exclude ourselves from the dilemma, but we must manage it. Last but not least, in both cases in Gaza and Lebanon, we do investigate ourselves both on the operational and commanding aspects and on the legal aspect itself. Uh, we, get, we got hundreds, more than hundreds, several hundred, almost 500 events that were reported to us that we have checked. Some of them have been rebriefed. Some of them have been investigated. In some of them, people went to military court. Now, we do it not because it's the demand of the international community. We do it because we believe it's important for us. And if, some of my, if any of my soldiers killed a civilian by purpose, knowing it's a civilian, etc., etc., I want to take care of it, not someone else. It's for my moral strength, I would say, that it is so important for us not just the instrumental aspect of being right according to ICC, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we will continue to do so in the future as well. So if I have to sum up and say, to, 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 as closure, I think that dealing with those aspects, both in updating our operational tools, but also updating our legal tools, I would say, is important for us as uh, moral countries, moral societies that respect human rights, respect international laws, uh, and, and it's important for us to continue to stay like this. I think it is, it is such. 
The state of Israel is a state of law. The IDF is an organization who, work, who operates according to international laws and to values. Let me, for just, uh, we have our ethical code that brings our main values uh, and we teach them to all our soldiers. Purity of arms, I'm just co quoting from it one paragraph. The soldier shall make use of his weaponry and power only for the fulfillment of it, the mission and solely to the extent required. He will maintain his humanitarian event even in combat. The soldier shall not employ his weaponry and power in order to harm non-combatant or prisoners of war and shall do all he can to avoid harming their lives, body, honor, and property. It doesn't mean, say here, it says in other places that we should stick to our target and mission as well. But we demand this dilemma from both me as the, f f as the former commander of the IDF and the soldier that joined the IDF yesterday. Uh, and we teach them from day one. Does it mean we make no mistakes? No, it doesn't mean that we make no mistakes. Does it mean that we don't have people that sometimes do the thing that we don't want them to do? No, it doesn't mean that way. The Israeli society have raised the story of black flag by itself, not by anyone else. We know where we came from. We know where we want to be in. Uh, so we should stick to it. I suggest that we will avoid strategic naivety, legal naivety, and try to promote both operational capabilities but also legal tools that will enable us to, f to, to, uh, to cope with, uh, uh, with, uh, with the future realities as we see it. Last but not least, I will share with you my experience, painful experience, of visiting 75 families in the last four months of my service as the chief of staff. I went to visit each and every family of a fallen soldier that lost in life in Gaza. No media, just them and me. I went and visited the civilians that were killed. to include the family of Daniel Tegerman, four years, four, four years old, that I was in the same kibbutz when they shot those mortars from a UN uh, in, uh, in, in so installation in, in Gaza. They have pain. I cannot re recover the sorrow. I cannot bring them their loved ones. But they all understood what and why we did it. And most of them, obviously you have, uh, you have the others, but 95% of them realize that we have activated our force with the best courses that we could and manage this dilemma. Because this is how they grew up and educated their own kids that were the soldiers on the ground when the operation happened. So it is our strategic and moral necessity to remember that even if you, that sometimes the weak side it's not necessarily the right side. And to update the laws that will enable us to be not just strong, but to enable us to protect democracy, human life, human values, because the other sides care nothing about it. And each area has different but yet similar challenges. Thank you for listening.